The Da Vinci Science Center, in partnership with PBS 39, present the 2020 Women in Science and Engineering Forum panel discussion. Good evening. My name is Lynn Erickson, and I am the Executive Director and CEO of the Da Vinci Science Center. Thank you for joining us this evening for the annual Women in Science and Engineering Forum. Usually, this event takes place in the spring in conjunction with a mentoring dinner for high school students, but we were unable to host that event due to the public shutdowns surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. Thankfully, we're past that now, and we are able to host this evening's discussion for you, thanks to our friends at Lehigh Valley Public Media. The Da Vinci Science Center, located in Allentown, is a hands-on science center dedicated to bringing science to life and lives to science for students and families throughout Eastern Pennsylvania and Western New Jersey. At Da Vinci, we are passionate about supporting women in STEM fields and inspiring young girls to follow in their footsteps. In Pennsylvania, the demand for STEM jobs is growing three times as fast as non-STEM jobs. For the Lehigh Valley, it is essential that more women be supported to enter and persist in the STEM workforce. The Lehigh Valley is among the top five fastest growing regions in the United States with a population of less than 1 million and the fastest growing region of its size in the Northeast. STEM heavy occupations make up 19% of all jobs. Despite women holding 49% of all jobs in the region, they represent just 29% of the STEM workforce. Women have the lowest representation in the engineering and computer and mathematical sciences, where much of the growth in STEM jobs is occurring. The growing demand for a STEM workforce can be met by hiring more women to work in these fields. So it is our job to encourage and support today's young girls so that they can become tomorrow's STEM workforce. I'd like to take a few minutes to recognize those groups and organizations who make this event possible. First, I would like to recognize Sanofi, our presenting sponsor, and our lead sponsors, ATAS International, B. Braun, Mack Trucks, and the Manufacturers Resource Center. I would also like to thank the sponsors whose names are now scrolling on your screens. We are very grateful to all of our sponsors for their commitment to advancing women in STEM careers. Many of these sponsors have supported the WISE initiative for several years. Through its WISE initiative, the Da Vinci Science Center offers a number of programs and events throughout the year to introduce girls to STEM careers and to provide female STEM professionals with the opportunity to network and support each other. In addition to our annual WISE Forum and Dinner, we host Women in STEM Career Connection Field Trip Days, a STEAM Girls After School Club, Girl Scout Day and Camp In programs, and evening networking events for practicing STEM professionals. The Da Vinci Science Center's WISE initiative has attracted national funding through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. With the support of a two-year grant from IMLS, the Science Center conducted two research studies to better understand the support needed by girls and women in the Lehigh Valley to pursue and persist in STEM careers. The results deepened our understanding of the hopes, dreams, challenges, and needs of girls and women. It is our goal to work with the Greater Lehigh Valley community to create a STEM ecosystem of support and opportunities for women and girls to build a pipeline of future talent to serve the growing STEM economy. For information on these studies or to get involved with the WISE initiative, please visit davinciSciencecenter.org. Before we begin the panel discussion, I would like to introduce you to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, If Then Ambassadors Program. This program brings together 125 talented women STEM professionals from across a variety of industries to serve as high-profile role models of women in STEM on a national platform. 
we will share four short video clips of If Then Ambassadors during this evening's program. I encourage you to explore this collection further at your leisure. I still remember my first few camps with England and thinking like what is my role, what am I going to do here, what actually can I help with and it took me a few camps just to sit in there and observe and then finally from my training and education work out okay we can do this from a training perspective, we can look at diet, we can look at recovery, everything off the field as much as everything on the field. And then as technologies progressed over the years from just heart rate monitors, which is the internal load, to then using GPS systems, which is then, okay, we know internally what the heart rate is, well, what is the player actually doing? It's a device probably half the size of your cell phone. We put it in a sports bra, kind of between their shoulder blades at the back, and it picks up every movement that the player makes on the field. So. We can track distance move, we can track speeds, we can then set thresholds individual to that athlete, that player. A big thing we look at is what is a player's peak maximal speed and then are they hitting 90% of that each week to almost protect about the hamstring because they're going to need to do that in a game. So we then use some of those markers to then plan and predict training. And now it's time to introduce our panel. Please welcome Rosalind Hollingsworth, who will serve as moderator for this discussion. Roz is the Global Medical Franchise Lead for Influenza in Global Medical Affairs at Sanofi. Thank you, Lynn. I am delighted to host tonight's Women in Science and Engineering Forum and this panel of distinguished female leaders in STEM. As Lynn noted, I am the Global Medical Franchise Head for Influenza Vaccines at Sanofi based at our Swiftwater site in the beautiful Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. I'm also currently working with our teams on two vaccines for the prevention of COVID-19 disease. So I hope you all wish us well. After completing my education in the UK, where the topic of my PhD thesis was host and viral factors impacting the outcome of hepatitis C virus infection, I joined the pharmaceutical industry to work on the development of novel vaccines, as well as strategies to ensure these vaccines reach those who need them. I made my decision on a STEM career quite late. I didn't attend university immediately from high school and spent some time figuring out what I wanted to do. So, as I'm sure you all are, I am very interested to listen to what I am expecting to be very diverse experiences of the women in science and engineering that we are joined by this evening. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our panel. Firstly, Jill Evans. Jill is Manager of Customer Service for the Industrial Hydraulics Division of Bosch Rexroth, a global leader in drive and control components for our diverse range of industries. Jill recently stepped into a leadership role after 27 years as an engineer in Rexroth's Plastics Machinery Group where she designed and supported hydraulic systems for injection molding and blow molding machines throughout the country. Jill was also a charter member of the Bethlehem chapter of Women at Bosch, an employee resource group whose mission is to engage, educate and empower associates. Secondly, Dr. Keisha Hortman, Hawthorne, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer for Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, or as we more fondly refer to it, CHOP. Keisha provides strategic leadership of the Information Services Department, which includes 550 full-time employees who support over 500 applications and approximately 16,000 employees and 21,000 active directory accounts, supporting CHOP strategic initiatives to protect patient safety and pr promote information security. In 2019, Keisha was recognized as the most influential woman in health IT by the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society. Dr. Hawthorne is unfortunately not able to join us in the studio today. She is participating in the broadcast from Philadelphia. Next up, we have Megan McGovern, quality business team leader for Cab Over Product at Mack Trucks, Inc. As a quality business team leader, Megan and her team monitor production performance through assembly technician feedback, performance testing, and cumulative feedback from dealers and customers in the field. Her experience also includes six years in the Air Force, two years at the DEA, and 12 months traveling the world, 
benchmarking world-class manufacturing operations as part of the Volvo Group's International Graduate Programme. I also have pleasure to introduce Lisa Scheller, President and Chairman for Silverline Manufacturing, a world leader and global supplier of high quality special effect and performance pigments. Under her leadership, Silverline has won numerous awards and accolades, most recently the national certification as Women's Business Enterprise by the Women's Business Enterprise Council of Pennsylvania, Delaware and Southern New Jersey. Silberline is based in Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, with manufacturing facilities in the US, Scotland, and in China. Camille Schreier, who was crowned Miss America in December of 2019, is a STEM advocate with dual degrees in biochemistry and systems biology, and is currently pursuing her Doctor of Pharmacy at Virginia Commonwealth University. Camille broke from tradition to perform the catalytic decomposition of hydrogen peroxide as her onstage talent during the Miss America competition. Her unique talent performance and focus on women in STEM has sparked a positive reaction of inclusivity. And last but not least, we're pleased to welcome Nancy Wang, from, who's come all the way from Seattle to be with us this evening. Nancy is Head of Product Management for Amazon Web Services Data Protection. She has a history of building and launching large-scale enterprise systems in storage data management and networking. Nancy is passionate about the democratization of data and empowering more women as tech leaders. And so she has also co-founded the nonprofit organization Advancing Women in Product. Welcome to you all, thanks for joining me. The full biographies of each of our panelists may be found in a program book on our website at davinciSciencecenter.org slash wise. So we're going to start this e the discussion this evening with a series of questions we have prepared for each of the panelists. All of the panelists, however, will be encouraged to comment on the responses given by their peers, sharing their own unique experiences. Following the prepared questions, we will turn the program over to you, the audience, for your questions. You can submit your questions tonight as indicated on the screen. So to start off, we're going to pose a question for everyone. And the question that I'm going to have is, what's so great about STEM and why do you love to do your job? Um, and I sort of thought maybe I could get things started and give you a little bit of insight into why I love what I do. Um, and, you know, it's difficult because there's much about my everyday job that I love. There's some things that I hate, uh, but much that I love. But at the end of every day, what it really comes back to for me is the science. It is constantly changing. There's always something new to learn. I work with really smart people. We have great teams of great people that I can have wonderful conversations with day to day about science and the things that we're passionate about in the scientific world. But the other thing that I enjoy about this is meeting people like you who really show that there is a immense diversity in the opportunity that we have in STEM. We're all doing something completely different, all at the cutting edge. And I think that in the context of the current pandemic, probably all of us here today are either doing something to help eradicate the pandemic or to keep the country running uh, while we get through this all together. So perhaps that's a little bit about what drives me every day in this world. Uh, so Nancy, maybe I can start with by asking you about what, what is STEM for you and what do you love about your job? Yeah, absolutely. I think just to start from my journey, Roz, similar to yours, you know, after graduating from the University of Pennsylvania here in state, uh, you know, I actually went through three different careers, starting from Wall Street, then working in the US government, and most recently in uh, technology out in the Silicon Valley and in Seattle. I think a common thread here is that regardless of what major or field you studied in college or in graduate studies, it really gives you a framework of thinking and processing problems or solving problems that 
it helps one to excel in their various uh, careers. And something I'm super excited about to share with you all today is why we need more women in tech leadership roles, because they serve as the role models, as everyone here, um, you know, all the awesome panelists, to inspire and to empower more young women and women who are entering STEM fields to strive for higher leadership levels. Thanks, Nancy. And to Camille, how about you? What has attracted you to STEM? You're just getting started, finishing your PhD. Yes, so I have been that girl that has loved science since I was a little child. And I always wanted to pursue a career in STEM my entire life. And now um, I have a few different roles that I hold in the STEM community. I am a doctor of pharmacy student. I will be completing that in 2024 now. Um, but I was drawn to the pharmaceutical industry as I presume you would be as well because of the impact that it can make on on people. We're able to save and change people's lives with the products that the pharmaceutical industry creates. It's not a perfect industry. There's been lots of issues that have come up, but I think that the only way that we can really change that is to be that person that gets inside and moves it forward. Mm -hmm. And there's so much good that that industry can do. So I'm excited for a career in the pharmaceutical industry one day, but I'm also serving the role as Miss America right now. And I am a STEM ambassador for women across the country, but I really see myself not even just as a, a woman ambassador for STEM, but really a STEM ambassador for all young people. And so I can go around and meet thousands and thousands of young students and tell them why I love science and why I think I'm a wonderful science nerd um, and why that's cool. And also to kind of break the stereotype of what Miss America always looked like, people are surprised that I am a Miss America who has a science background and is pursuing graduate education. And I don't know why anyone is surprised <laughs> by that, but I hope that I'm able to change that and show that I can be a feminine woman who also loves science and that I don't have to choose. Thank you. I think for all of us that wear our lab coat as our crown, uh, we're happy that you have both and pleased that you can join us. So thanks for that. Uh, Lisa. Thank you for that. Um, what, what's not to love about STEM? It's you know learning something new every single day, um, being able to grow. And, and, and what Nancy said, um, Originally, you're talking about being creative problem solvers. You know, when I got my degrees in math and in engineering, um, what I was learning about was how to solve problems and how to use those critical thinking skills and how to use that creative, solve and prob creative sol problem solving to actually make the world a better place. And I think that's a, a really important thing. Um, in a STEM career, you literally can do anything that you want to do, whether, you know, it's, my business, we, we manufacture things. I'm a manufacturing systems engineer. And, and in my business, we take this dull gray material and we transform it into something very beautiful that's used in so many, so many lives every day, whether it's a, a silver apple on the back of a cell phone or a crinkle wrapper on uh, your favorite sports drink or something that's used for a functional purpose or even in the, your automotive paint. You know, we're just creating things that people want and people need. Um, I think it's great to see women getting involved in these fields. I really still believe that we need more women in these fields and um, are working for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Megan. Hi, Ross. So uh, STEM is actually really interesting to me because I look at myself as not necessarily the scientist with the lab coat or the person who's creating the, the database structure. I'm, I really look at myself more as the supporting cast. Um, I'm one of those people who always had a knack for science and, and mathematics, but it wasn't something that I did dedicate myself to. And it, it was something that I kind of came to in a roundabout way. Uh, so after being a mechanic in the Air Force for a number of years, I came home and I realized that that was something that I really okay. did crave and something that I really did enjoy. Um, I was the little girl that would follow her, <laughs> follow her father around when he was working on the car and just ask, why, why, why do you do that? How does that work? Show me that one. <laughs> and um, I was someone who was really driven by people. And so being in the quality field now in manufacturing, I get a great opportunity to be someone who supports um, the, the making of an American legacy product, Mack trucks. You know, I get to walk around these things every day and it's awesome. And we get to play detective in the quality field. You know, we do start with a problem and we have to work our way back and figure out what happened. And so now I get to ask that question, why? Constantly, um, to the point that it, it probably drives my employees a little bit crazy <laughs> sometimes. Um, but being able to do that and be involved with people and be able to um, flex that leadership muscle uh, really feels good at the end of the day when you can go back and look at something that you have uh, really impacted 
uh, that people recognize. And so to me, that's that's why I, I really think STEM is super broad and I love the, the position that I've ended up in with it. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you. I mean, what I've enjoyed already just going around the room is uh, the passion and enthusiasm and excitement that we all have for everything that we do. So it's terrific. Um, so now we're making a short hop to Philadelphia to hear from Keisha. Thank you so much. Um, I would echo what all the other panelists have said. And then I'd like to add that okay. um, within healthcare, there's an opportunity uh, to see science, technology, engineering, and math uh, happening live in action. Um, we're saving children's lives. We're discovering new vaccines. Um, we're looking at how we're practicing our nursing and care for our patients. And within IS, we might be doing something um, as novel as identifying threats within our computer system. At CHOP, we focus a lot on research and innovation. We call that our North Star. And we think that that leads us to breakthroughs every day. So the thing that I think about when I think about STEM is there's an opp opportunity to make a breakthrough in so many different pathways and perspectives and areas within healthcare. Um, and that's why I think it's exciting to be in this field. Okay, terrific, thank you. And when I open by saying, you know, we fondly refer to it as CHOP, I think that's because, not because of the CHOP name, but because of what you all contribute every day in terms of health of uh, the children in our communities. So very grateful for that. And finally, last but not least again, Jill, like, we'd love to hear from you. Well, what I like the best about uh, STEM fields is that it changes every day. My job changes every day. Uh, when I was doing engineering, which wasn't very long ago, it, I never knew what was going to happen next. Who was going to need something a little bit different than what somebody needed the day before? So it was changing in, in a variety of ways. Not that the physics of it was changing, mind you, because the physics doesn't change, but the way we apply the physics. And a lot of people are fairly anti-plastics these days, but what we're doing in the field of, of you making uh, plastics machinery is finding ways to make plastic things in a more efficient way so that there's less waste, so that there's less uh, transportation cost. If a bottle, for example, uses less plastic, it doesn't waste as much, it doesn't um, and it doesn't uh, uh, cost as much to transport it as opposed to, for example, glass or whatever. But actually working on these machines as we're working to make them more energy efficient is really exciting because plastics aren't going away, but the way we make them is getting more efficient and using less and less energy to do it. So, um, so that's the kind of thing that we were involved in back when uh, last year when I was doing engineering. And now moving into a leadership role, it's even more exciting because now I can help other people learn the kinds of things that we're doing, the products that we supply, and also work with, uh, with my employees uh, and my associates so that they can enjoy their work too. So now I'm applying it a little differently differently, but I really like the peace people part of doing my job as well. Okay. So thank you for that. So I think we've heard several themes through each of the, um, uh, the commentary that you've given. I, for me, I, I've heard problem solving and it's always a challenge. There's always something new to do. Um, I've also heard that physics is fantastic. I don't know necessarily that I would agree. That wasn't my strong point, but you know, um, but I think it was very similar recurring themes ask questions, be curious, find out how things work and how we can think, make things better. I think that's something that's common to, to everything that we've said so far. Okay, so we're gonna switch to the individual questions that have been prepared for each of you. We're gonna go back the other way around. Uh, so Jill, it's over to you again and our question. Um, Many who would have been in the audience when we were going to hold this event in person are high school students and college students uh, who are in the midst of making the tough decisions about future education and career plans. How did you choose your career and what advice would you have for others going through that now? Well, to tell you the truth, I didn't plan on being an engineer in hydraulics when I, went, when I finished 
uh, high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and I played around a little bit and majored in a couple of different things. And it seems like okay. at that time oh. you kind of need, you were supposed to know what you wanted to do for the rest of your life. Well, the rest of your life is going to be the rest of your life. So what I ended up doing was I ended up getting three quarters of a degree in computer science, and I was working for NASA, and I decided I didn't really like working for NASA. I didn't really like computer programming for a spacecraft in the aerospace industry, which to a lot of people is really exciting. <laughs> um, but for me, it just wasn't for me. It wasn't what I wanted to do. So what I did at that point in time is I quit college. I moved to Northern California because I was in Southern California. I moved to Northern California and I got married. And I had always intended on going back to school. Um, but what I really needed was a job. So I found a job. It happened to be in a company that was a distributor for hydraulic components. And all of a sudden, I found my love. My real true love was hydraulics. <laughs> and I went up the ranks in that company for a little while. And, uh, and I ended up in Pennsylvania because I saw an opportunity. Um, I wanted to work for a manufacturer. And the manufacturer that I chose to work for was Rexroth. And my advice for that is to get as many internships as you can, first of all, because it wasn't too late after my work at, at NASA to stop and redirect my career. Um, but find out what, you really, what you're really passionate about. If you decide to get through four years or five years these days of an engineering degree, don't think that you have to be, if you majored in mechanical engineering, don't think that you have to be a mechanical engineer. You can take that education and apply it to electrical engineering or a hard science or anything else. You've got the background. You've got the math. You've got the physics. You've got the chemi chemistry. You've got all of those kinds of things that are the background, bare, the, uh, the bare backbone is what I'm trying to say, <laughs> the, is, is the backbone for any kind of engineering or science career. Okay. Thanks, Jill. I, I mean, I think that um, having an open mind and being flexible, you know, that's certainly what I've found to be most helpful in, in my career. Um, I think we're all living longer. We don't have to make a decision anymore that we need a career for life or one job for life with one company. Many of us maybe choose to stay. But I find that that, you know, this idea of reinventing ourselves, um, even as some of us are getting older, that um, we might, uh, you know, I, I think that's still many opportunities for us within this field to, to change and move. Um, so thank you. Okay, so I did lie. Uh, we're not going back around the room. My next question actually for you, Nancy. <laughs> so, um, Keeping us on our toes. Yeah. <laughs> so with your flourishing career in the tech world and the co-founding of your nonprofit organization, Advancing Women in Product, can you talk a little bit about how your background in STEM has led to your success today and your ability to advance others? Yeah, absolutely. And so kind of from the uh, opening question, which was around the framework of thinking, it's uh, going back to actually here, I'm going to borrow some of Amazon's leadership principles is, you know, learn and be curious is one of our 14 leadership principles. And I know, you know, before I, I joined the company, it was, okay, where are the, these 14 tenets that we need to focus on and that are core to how you conduct sort of your day-to-day -day activities. And just being um, a product manager, when I first joined Big Tech and Google, I was the first uh, woman on the team at Google Fiber's uh, product management team and continue being uh, the youngest and also the uh, youngest female um, acting general manager at Amazon Web Services. I think part of that journey has led me to really believe in the power of community and that we're all here to really solve the gap, right? To put our minds together into thinking of what are the uh, reasons or root cause analysis behind this gap in both women entering the STEM fields as well as the factors that are impacting women's retention as well as promotion into leadership. Uh, roles. So that's why I'm super excited to see that there are many women here who are in leadership roles like yourself, Roz, and um, you know, Jill, among others. So definitely love to hear all of your perspectives as well. Okay, thanks very much for that, Nancy. Okay, so the next question is going to Lisa. Um, challenges are to be expected 
in a career, no matter what field you choose, STEM or otherwise. Uh, what is important to you, uh, what is important is when you face those challenges is that you can persevere. Can you talk about a time in your own career when th things perhaps were difficult, you know, there was a problem, a challenge, uh, and an example of how you've persevered to get to where you are today? Uh, certainly, thank you. Um, there are always challenges in anyone's career. And um, I think the most important thing to learn, um, or that I've learned, is that you need perseverance and persistence. And that a challenge might be a setback, but it doesn't mean that you're done. It means that you, you take a step back, you take a look at what's going on, and that you can move forward. In 1997, early 1997, um, I had the opportunity for the first time, my, my, actually I'll go step back, my career started actually in the IT field. I was working uh, on some Doppler radar programs for, for the government, um, which was very, very interesting, and found myself then um, going to work for my family's business. And in 1997, um, I became vice, pre vice president of uh, process engineering and IT. Uh, eight months later, my brother who was running the company, who's very close to me, um, passed away very suddenly and unexpectedly. And I had a big decision to make. I had very young children at the time. My children were four and six. I had this nice nine to five job at the time. And I had to make a decision, do I wanna go really into leadership or do I wanna sell the business or do I actually, am I actually capable? And there were no women in this industry in the world. In fact, today, I, I have the only women owned business in my entire industry in the world. And it was a question that I said, do I really have to answer that right now? And so what I ended up doing was putting together a board of advisors or mentors, including some women who I really admired and who could give me great guidance. And I asked them the question, you know, can I do this and will I like doing this? And they said, you won't know unless you try it. And I made the decision that I was gonna try it for a year and see if I felt that I was capable of doing it. And I think, I won't say as all women, we underestimate what our true capabilities really are, but I think, for myself, I did underestimate what my capabilities were. And they said, if you don't like what you're doing in a year, you'll know. And if you're not capable, we'll all know. And uh, that, was that was 20. <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and I found out what it meant to really do what was in front of me and really step up. Um, and I've tried to provide that same opportunity to women both in my organization and, and along the way that I've met. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that story, and I, you know, I think f uh, from my perspective, that uh, idea that it's not okay to fail, uh, whether personally or in the capacity of what we do every day, is a really important point because. Um, we heard about you know being flexible in your career choices and jumping into things when you were going to be the only woman. You have to you have to be willing to fail. I've walked into any number of situations where I walk into the room and I'm, I'm in a leadership role and I'm the only woman in the room. Yeah. That has to change. Yeah, I agree with that too. Uh, but I think that sense of failure as well, or the, the idea of failure, you know, it comes back to the problem solving, the asking the questions, not just looking at something and say, well, it failed. Um, you know, it's why did it fail? What can I do differently next time around? And I think that applies personally as well as professionally. It's just my perspective. Okay. So next up is Camille, and we're going to go completely off the script now uh, because I saw you earlier this morning on the Da Vinci Science Center website um, with elephant's toothpaste. So I'm going to have a couple of questions for you, but for those who weren't able to see you earlier today, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about the elephant's toothpaste. Yes, so I was up at the Da Vinci Science Center and I was able to recreate the demonstration that I did at Miss America. And I am actually the first Miss America to ever win using a science demonstration, particularly a chemistry demonstration, as my onstage performing talent. And that's the first time that that's really happened before. And that's really exciting. So I got to show that um, virtually this morning to hopefully some schools locally who were able to tune in. And that's kind of what my COVID experience has looked like, is doing virtual demonstrations and STEM outreach throughout, throughout my time and doing it from my home. Okay. So for those that did miss it, I think it's still available on the Da Vinci Science Center website. So you can go and have a look and find out what 
elephant's toothpaste is all about. Uh, but I came on just as you were finishing the demonstration, actually, and I was really interested in what you had to say about what happened when you went with your proposal mm -hmm. to have a science talent. So it was kind of a joke in my family that if I ever competed for Miss America, what would I do for my talent? Because I don't sing or dance or play an instrument. I don't... Um, you know, do any kind of per traditional performing talent that you would think of. Okay. And the joke was, well, you should, you're a scientist, you love science, it's been what you've loved forever, you should do a chemistry demonstration or a science demonstration or do calculus. But part of it needed to be entertaining. And so I fell into the realm of science entertainment and doing these demonstrations in a way that was really engaging, but also taught the audience something. And the reaction, to make a chemistry joke, was actually um, kind of, you know, it was not positive always at first because people were very, um, you questioned what I was doing. They thought I was a little crazy because nobody really does this. And I think one of the things that we see in society now is just following the norm because everyone else does something. And that's not a good enough reason to go and do something that's not true to who you are. And I think that goes back to innovation. So I ended up doing this chemistry demonstration to solve a problem. I didn't sing, dance, play an instrument, or twirl a baton. So I did science. And I think that my scientific mindset allowed me to have that innovative creativity and solve that problem. Um, but I really, it was a surprise. People were, were a little skeptical at first, but I hope I can change their minds and show them that science is a talent, because it is. Okay. So thank you very much. I'm also very grateful, as with the physics point, that it was not calculus, frankly. I, Everyone was. was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Um, so now for Keisha. Um, what do you see as the future opportunities for women pursuing a STEM career? You know, where do you expect us all to go from here? And uh, what are the exciting things that you see in this field? So I think there are many exciting opportunities upcoming in the science and technology and engineering and mathematics field, especially in healthcare. Uh, specifically, we're looking for um, uh, leaders and um, employees uh, that are data scientists. Uh, folks specifically trained in information security. That is a hot, hot area for um, not only healthcare, but institutions across the world. Uh, we have a strong need for cloud engineers and also system developers. During COVID, we specifically have seen an increase in our telehealth and patient facing technologies. So jobs like that and, and careers going in that trajectory are important. And the last two I'll talk about are clinical informatics, uh, both physicians and nursing clinical informaticists that help clinicians um, adopt technology, use it, and research it. And then finally, our biomedical engineers. All of our uh, health devices in any hospital that you go to are typically networked and um, are connected to the electronic medical system and to your data center. And so having people that can bridge the gap between those life-saving technologies. I think to get there, however, we need to do two things. We need to make sure we're creating a pipeline for um, specifically minority and women so that they know that there's interest and there's opportunity early. Uh, we do a CHOP Tech event every year where we invite girls age six grade to freshmen in high school to come participate and learn about all of the health technology roles we have and STEM roles we have at CHOP. We also offer a co-op year round to students from local universities, and we reach out specifically to historically black colleges and universities to recruit talent. The second thing is mentoring. Uh, mentorship is key. Um, we need it to support, to get people to stay in the field once they're here. One of the other panelists mentioned uh, retention. So across the industry, as we can bring more people together and especially have more minorities and women, uh, that will let people see that they can do this um, and they can jump into one of these jobs. Thanks, Keisha. And I think, you know, the idea of telehealth is attractive to everyone who's been working in their pajamas for the last six months. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. But I know that, you know, there are often great collaborations between my industry, the pharmaceutical industry and, and organizations such as yours to make, you know, make uh, use your systems to understand how we can improve our medicines, how our medicines are working in the real world, what, what else we can learn, how we can make our medicines safer. Um, so those are changing our lives as well every day and thinking about how we're going to be uh, doing, doing conducting our research. Okay, so Megan, 
uh, you're in the hot seat now. Um, so we've already heard from Lisa that often many of us are, we walk into a room and we're the only woman there. Um, so how do you demonstrate uh, that you have a right to be there, that you're effective, that you're credible, that you know how to do your job, that you're a leader? Uh, well, sometimes it's hard to know if you are effectively doing that. Um, but one of the, the biggest things that I've learned by moving around through different parts of my career, you talked about doing different internships. Uh, we've talked about problem solving and not doing things in the traditional way. And like, like she said, uh, walking in and being the only woman in the room is adaptability is key. You have to be able to think critically and you have to be able to adapt to your conditions and your situation. Um, so when I was younger, I was the oldest sibling and the only girl. Uh, so the way that I made sure that I got my voice heard was I'm bigger than you and I'm going to push you around until you are bigger than me and now I can't do that anymore. Um, and then I joined the military um, not long after high school. Um, I did work for a few years but the military just was kind of calling to me. And it was really uh, interesting how I picked my job when I got into the military. Uh, I took the ASVAB and I aced it except for one question. And so I asked the recruiter, well, what question did I miss? Oh, it was a mechanical question. I will go into the Air Force open mechanical. We're gonna get better at this, okay? He looked at me like I had grown a third eye in the middle of my forehead. Nobody does that, what are you talking about? It's like, no, it's gonna be fine, We're, it's gonna be great. Um, and I got into boot camp and I was open mechanical so I didn't have an assigned job. And so it came time to fill out your dream sheet. What jobs do you want? And they gave me a list of all the open mechanical positions. And I turned to the person beside me and I said, well, so what's the hardest one to get into? <laughs> and they said, well, for egress, you have to be able to deadlift about 160, 570 pounds. Now, mind you, at the time, I weighed a buck 35. And I said, yeah, OK. I wrote it right at the top of my dream sheet. And they were like, you should, you should put a few more choices on there. Yeah, it's going to be fine. I got this. It's no problem. Um, and it almost killed me, <laughs> but I did it. I, I, I lifted the weights. Uh, standing in front of the line of boys that were like, you are insane and did it. Okay, all right, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and when I got into my role uh, in the Air Force, I was the only girl that did what I did at every single base that I was stationed at. Um, and it was familiar because of growing up in a family full of boys, but it was terrifying because I had absolutely no idea how I was going to uh, make people understand that I cared about what I was doing, that I wasn't just here because, oh, it's the military and it's fun. I really did enjoy what I did in the military. Um, and so I would surprise people. You get a nickname when you're in the military. Nobody will call you by your actual name. And since I'm Mick Govern, I became known as Sergeant Mack. Well, that means with a name like Sergeant Mack, nobody knows you're a girl <laughs> until they meet you. <laughs> and then they go, oh, well, hello. <laughs> Um, and so it was having that opportunity to really prove within the boys club that I am doing all the same things that you are doing and yes, I will climb onto that F-15 and I will try to do that seat lift and I will struggle miserably at it, but I am not gonna quit. I'm going to do it. And so I led by example in that, in that arena. And then coming into civilian society was a really, really difficult transition for me. Um, I didn't feel like I belonged there anymore and I, I didn't feel like I knew as much as everybody else, you know, I had, I had come out and used my GI Bill, but I didn't necessarily stay there for very long. I was new. Um, and so the best thing I could do was ask all those why questions. I didn't just want to work at Volvo and work at Mac. I wanted to know what you did. And we were going to be friends. We were going to network. If I have a question, I'm coming to you. And I wanted to know exactly what in the world data stuff you were doing so that if I got stuck, I could come and ask you a question. And I wanted to know about all the different ways that the cogs fit together in the corporate world of where I was so that I became a linchpin of information. I was not necessarily a technical expert in any one place, but I could talk to you about where to find the resources for anything. Um, and so being able to adapt to the situation that you find yourself in is critical. And being able to think your way through a problem is critical. Um, and that is the way to really make your mark on where you are and make people remember who you are and show you the, the respect that you do deserve. You belong in the room. Um, and there should be more people like you in the room. Uh, and so that's, 
Yeah, it's, it's always a learning experience. It's never boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you. So your intense question asking as a child persisted then all the way through. Okay. <laughs> you can make a career out of it. <laughs> okay, so um, I'd like to ask uh, Lisa and Jill, maybe you've got your own perspective on or can add to what we've heard from Megan in terms of that credibility, that leadership. What, what makes a woman in this industry a leader looks Jill's ready to go so. well I can I can take that a little bit uh, in terms of of knowing that you can uh, that you belong in the room uh, for example uh, one of my ver first experiences uh, when I was working and uh, doing technical things in hydraulics was I received a phone call um, there were no women doing technical stuff in hydraulics back then and I received a phone call from a customer, and they said, they said, I'd like to have information on this. And I said, my name's Jill, and I can help you. And they said, no, I want to talk to a man. Okay. Okay. And to, to which I said, I said, I'll tell you what. I will get you an answer, and if you don't like my answer, then I will transfer you to someone who is, who is a man to answer the question. Well, I answered his question in a thorough manner, in a correct manner, and, and he always, after that, always called me first. So that's how you start getting the confidence to know that you know what you're doing. And if you keep applying that, it's like, I know what I'm doing, now let me show you I know what I'm doing. If you ask me a question, I'll either get you an answer or I'll find out where to find that answer. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we can feel confident in ourselves. Um, I've been the only woman in the room so many times that I don't even recognize that I'm the only woman in the room because I just fit in with the guys at this point in time, for the most part. Uh, there, there are some times that they'll, they'll be very careful with their language, but, <laughs> but for the most part, I fit, I fit in the room yeah. because I've been doing it for a very long time. Okay, thank you. So, Lisa, for you, we're just going to change the question oh, okay. just to keep you on your toes, sure. just a little bit. Okay. So it's related. It's about being the only woman in the room. And, but, you know, what does gender balance look like at your organization and how have you thought about uh, getting to that point of the right balance between men? and women in your organization? Well, certainly, gender balance within, our, within my organization is important, and it is an important thing to strive for. Truly, we want to get the best people and the most qualified people for the jobs, whether they're STEM jobs or they're not STEM jobs. In my organization, I've hired and promoted and mentored many, many women, both in STEM and non-STEM uh, positions within the company. But when we look at when I look at my graduating class from Lehigh University, where 10% of the women 10% of the class was women. And I look at the number of resumes that I'm getting in when I go out there looking for a chemist or an engineer or a fit someone with the backgrounds in physics, we're not seeing the same number of resumes coming in from men and women. And that's where we really need to dig deep and really look at our, our youth and, and women who are growing up and how do we encourage women to get into these fields mm -hmm. so that, that that equation can change. And it is changing, but it's not changing as much as it needs to change and as quickly as it needs to change because um, I'm very proud that my, my daughter is also an engineer, and, uh, but her class, she was also the, the minority. Uh, she, women were also the minority in her class and in her workforce, she lives in Atlanta uh, and works for an engineering consulting firm, she is also among the minority there, a very significant minority. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we need to really work at how do we get young women, young girls excited about STEM careers so that at the end of the day, when it comes to th the time to graduate college or come out of a vocational school with some kind of technical diploma from a vocational school, which is just as important in STEM, that, that we have e equal numbers of people who are qualified from a completely diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, I think, you know, I, I think one of the important things that you said for me is this idea that we don't all follow the same path. And we've heard that this evening with the military route and then, you know, with the opportunities for vocational schools rather than a traditional college route. I think that's really critical. But one thing that we haven't really 
talked about, although you've all mentioned it in a few times, and I think it's important in the context of gender balance, is the importance of mentors in our career development. And somebody mentioned internships and the importance of taking internships. So I'll, I think this is the last question we'll have time for, but perhaps I can start with Nancy and we can work our way back around. And I'd just be really interested to hear about the people that have made a difference as you've chosen your career and, and move forward with it. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm having dinner tonight with uh, my first uh, female mentor. She's a PhD organic chemist over at DuPont, uh, which is one of my first internships I had during college. Um, but I would say, you know, that's really the, the strength of sponsors versus mentors. And without going into too much specifics, you know, there's a Harvard Business School Review article that talks about how sponsors will actually put their reputation on the line for you. So, for example, um, the reason I'm at Amazon is that, you know, Sandy Carter, who's one of our uh, female vice presidents, hired me into the company, um, you know, as one of the, the youngest professionals in the role because she wanted to believe in me, um, in my potential. And that's really where I want to create a community called Advancing Women in Product where we can find sponsors in various corporate environments or organizations to sponsor young women or to sponsor early career women to take on those early leadership roles. Because, to, I mean, technically, you've never actually done the job until you've been a manager or been your first uh, leadership role. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Camille, we've already heard that family and friends were telling you it's got to be science as your talent, nothing else. So is there any one person in particular that has really influenced you and continues to encourage you? Yes, yeah, so actually I interned at Santa Fe when I was in college and I had a wonderful mentor there who was a PharmD who really opened my eyes to the pharmaceutical industry and what the opportunities a pharmacist might have there. Um, but one of the really important things about mentors, I think, is that you're able to demonstrate your skills and then they can kind of be your advocate, kind of what you were talking about in terms of sponsors. Because I think as women, we don't want to be hired for a job just because we're a woman. We want to be hired because of the skills that we have and what we can offer to that organization. And I think, Megan, what you did, kind of jumping into that role, you didn't care that you were the only woman there. And I think that that's wonderful. I think more women need to do that because it's really demonstrating what we can offer as women and then having those mentors to kind of guide us and lead us along the way. Yeah, thank you. And Lisa, we heard a little bit from you about, you know, people saying to you, well, you'll know if you can do it, and if you can't, then all of us will know. But is there any one, you know, standout person for you that really has helped you along the way? There's actually been a few standout, a few standout people, and they've actually been both men and women, I have to say. Um, but uh, when, I, when I first uh, took over the, le the leadership role in my business, it was a woman who had her own um, inks and graphic, graphic inks uh, manufacturing company. And uh, she really took me under her wing and said, you know, you can do this. And here's this kind of the skills that you need to do. And I, I'm really grateful to her. But uh, again, like I said, along the way, I, I, I will learn from anybody. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's a really important thing that, if, we, if we've been so blessed to be able to have these leadership roles and to have these skills and to see what we see about women in STEM careers and in any career, that, that we also have a responsibility to give back and to promote and to pay it forward so that young women coming up can see what we, have, what we are doing and can have those same opportunities. Yeah. Thank you, and, and I agree. I mean, despite the fact that I've been scared witless to be here in front of the cameras today, you know, I think that this is a wonderful opportunity to share our stories. But you did steal my next question for Megan, which was, I was going to ask, you know, we've, maybe many of our mentors have been women, but are there, have you had any men mentors that have been men? Uh, all, pretty much all of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you just by that. the nature of, of, my, of my history. Um, my primary one uh, has to be my dad. Um, and I know that's a little cliche, but <laughs> in truth, um, my dad was one of those people who he always fostered my ability to ask the question why, and he was very patient, even when I must have been driving him crazy. Um, but he taught me a rule about critical thinking that didn't really hit home for like another 20 years. <laughs> um, so I would ask my dad why all the time, and he would flip that question around on me as I got older, and I was working on homework and I didn't know how to do something. And he would say, well, why did, why did you do that step? Oh, okay, well then why did you do that step? What is, what is that? And he would make me explain it to him. And every time I would explain it to him, lo and behold, I would figure out the answer all by myself. <laughs> and um, I learned many years later that that's called the Socratic method. Just ask them until they figure it out. 
Um, and he confessed to me probably 15 years later, do you know why I did that? And I said, well, no, you know, you made me think all for myself. He was like, because I did not know the answer <laughs> to your question. Um, and I thought that was something that really kind of put a light bulb on for me. And it's something that I have utilized countless times, um, both in leadership and in the way that I'm approaching the work that I'm doing, because it's okay to not know the answer. It, it is so okay to not know the answer, but don't quit because you don't know the answer. Don't stop because it's hard. Go figure it out. Um, find more resources. Go ask somebody else. Uh, respect the intelligence and the knowledge of the person next to you and ask them for help. It's okay. Um, and so I, I really think overall from for all of my careers and all the amazing people that I have run into, um, that was something that has really stuck with me and it served me very well throughout most of my career. Excellent. Dad's a great like that. So, um, Keisha, over to you. What are, who have been the mentors in your life and who are you really grateful for? So I've had a mentor um, all along the way. And my first boss told me, when you become the leader and I'm reporting to you, I know I've done my job. Um, and that has carried with me uh, and carried me forward in the industry. I focus on mentoring anybody who asks for it, um, whether they're internal to CHOP or external. And my current uh, sponsor or champion, as I like to call him, um, was Dr. Brian Wolf. Uh, he is our chief scientific officer, and he used to be our chief information officer uh, prior to me. Um, and he invested a lot into me, not just professionally, but personally, but also was the one that encouraged and recommended me for the role at CIO at CHOP and has continued to support me in his new role, um, as well as our CEO. She's our first female CEO in 160 years, Madeline Bell, and she's a nurse by training. So I think all of the things that we said, you're going to have mentors, they might um, not look the way you think they're going to look or come from the background you think they're going to come from. Uh, but those mentors, those sponsors, those champions um, are important. So those are the two I'd like to recognize this evening. Okay. Thank you. And Jill. Well, I really had two uh, mentors that were pretty much formal mentors. Uh, when I first expressed uh, an interest in learning about hydraulics from the technical side at my first you know, real job after NASA, um, the engineer there took me under his wing and taught me everything he knew. And it was such a great help because as I was working and taking on some of the projects that would normally have fallen to him, he was right there with me, able to explain what I didn't, what I didn't understand. And so it was great to have, as my first uh, foray into hydraulics, to have this very experienced person that I could rely on. Uh, but then secondly, when I graduated from college finally in 2016, um, I all of a sudden realized that I didn't know what I wanted to do next. <laughs> I didn't have any goals. Well, my company has a wonderful program, which is a Bosch mentorship program, where it offers people from all different divisions, not just uh, the drive and control division that I work for, but all of our different divisions, they offer people mentorships. So there are people from div other divisions that offer to be mentors, and people from all the divisions that would like to be mentored. So I signed up for the program. I got a great mentor who helped me figure out what do I do want, want to do next. And I think although he wasn't a STEM mentor, he was a career mentor. He, let, he helped me actually work through that mind of figuring out what I wanted to do next and then helped me get there by understanding and helping me understand how to organize my thoughts and go through our uh, process that we have for indicating that you want a career change within my organization. Okay. So thank you. Those are all some great, great stories about the mentors. And I know I've had uh, mentors of my own that have made a huge difference to my career. And like all of you, they've been very diverse. They've been men, they've been women, they've been people in my industry, they've been people out of my industry, they've been my family, they've been my friends. But I think the most important thing for me has always been with a mentor to have that connection. You have to be on the same page as, as your mentor and, and uh, you know, be, be open-minded and willing to listen to their ideas, even the things that you might think, I can't do that. Um, but, you know, they wouldn't suggest it if they didn't think that you could. 
So thanks for indulging all of my questions. We're going to transition to the Q&A part of our program. And as we do so, we invite you to meet two more of the If Then ambassadors. One of the ways I, I'm hoping my work will impact the world is that it will accelerate the cure for a lot of diseases that we're trying to understand. And I got into this field because of my uncle. And even though he's no longer with us, hopefully me being part of the beginning of cures will help someone else not lose an uncle like I did. My uncle never had a chance to get married or have children and I don't want anyone to experience that. Even though he might not be here, being a part of cures for different diseases hopefully will help no one go through what I went through. The most exciting innovation that's come out recently, I would say is additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing. We start with a bed of powder and we build something straight up. And it's very cool because it's very custom. So you might have some very intricate and involved designs that can really change the face of the aerospace industry and multiple industries, and we can build that. You might have a different set of how you stand, and you can make shoe soles and 3D print them. You can 3D print your prosthetic. So things that are very customizable, especially that you maybe don't need to manufacture thousands of, 3D printing is a great option and it's fast and it's cool. Okay, so we heard some more great stories there. Uh, so we're ready for the Q&A session. And um, these are questions that have been sent in by the women, the young girls, the young ladies watching us um, today. Um, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on to read this. So, um, so uh, they're not, I don't think most of them are directed at a particular individual. There may, may be some as we go down. Um, but the first is um, from a senior at Cutstown, Cutstown? University of Pennsylvania, hope I said that correctly, sorry for the English, uh, studying community, computer science. We have created a club called Women in STEM to provide a community for women in STEM and outreach to younger females and advocate STEM. My question, well, not my, her question, what inspired everyone's interest in their respective careers and what made your journey unique? So I think we heard some of this when we started out the, this evening, um, uh, but perhaps if there's you know, something additional in terms of the, the, uh, the direction that you've taken and why you've taken it and, and uh, whether it's been by chance or by planning, I'll say by chance. Um, and maybe again, Nancy, we could start with you. Sure. So what really interested me in product management and working in the cloud computing world is really the opportunity to impact large businesses at scale. So if you think about the cloud and all the businesses that we power and all the transactions, you know, I heard telehealth tonight, I heard um, you know, just all of the e-commerce, for example, that happens during COVID time. I know I've, I've been guilty of this as well, right? So what powers that? What are the servers or databases that are running and powering the transactions? Um, that's really cool to me. And I think that could be a fantastic application of your computer science degree. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe we can hop to Keisha for your perspective. So um, early on, like many, I wanted to be a cardiologist. I was a biology major undergrad and I finished that and um, I went quickly into health administration after I took the MCAT um, and I had no plans on being a chief information officer. Uh, I think a lot of the panelists talked about your career. You can try to map it out as much as you want, but a lot of it is about taking on new opportunities, taking chances and working with people that see your um, you know, potential and can help make that happen. So um, I think the best thing about science, technology, engineering, math are the possibilities are endless. The industries are endless. Uh, we need you to, um, enter this field with us um, and I think you'll have a great career, but um, the path may not be straight, but you'll get there um, and you'll have a good time along the way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So a little voice in my ear said, we don't have time for everybody to answer every question, unfortunately. So I'm gonna move on to the next one and call on a couple of you that I haven't heard from um, to answer. Uh, but the question is, um, I'm just stepping into the professional field of uh, AI, data science and robotics. What advice would you give to women just starting their career 
um, who know what they want but don't know how to get started in a strictly male-dominated area. Um, so, Lisa, perhaps for, for you. Well, um, I would say um, congratulations. You're stepping into a really exciting uh, field, of, field of career and uh, um, career path and uh, something that's really up and coming and it's going to be able to make a huge impact on our world in the future. So, you know, knowing that you can make this impact should make you feel really good. I think um, when I began getting into a career field where I, was, where I was the only woman in the room, I wasn't always the only woman in the room because I knew there were women outside of the room and I knew there were women who had, who had done things that maybe they weren't exactly the same thing but similar and I began seeking them out and, and talking to them about how do I work my way through all of this? How do I, how do I find out? You know, what do I need to know to make this connection? How do I need to um, work within this environment to succeed? And some of it I would be, I agreed with, and some of it was like, no, I'm gonna carve my own path here. Because sometimes, you know, you don't just wanna go along to get along, or get along to go along, because you're just gonna stay stagnant where you are. Sometimes you have to make waves, sometimes you have to break the rules, sometimes you have to stand out. And that's how you might be able to get yourself ahead. But uh, I wish you all the best of luck. I think it's going to be a great career. AI is definitely the future. And uh, good luck. Yeah, thank you. And Jill, uh, your perspective on the AI, robotics, maybe this fits with the hydraulics question. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, it's funny because actually I, uh, I participated in, in something called the innovation framework. And one of the things that uh, I was working on, on in our company's innovation fra framework was actually a robotic dog. So, <laughs> so but it, it's really interesting. So, uh, but I think the, the question of, of how do you break into that field uh, that's mostly male dominated? And I think that, that in any field that you're looking at, if you don't know how to get started, and this is advice that I give to my daughter over and over again, is find someone in that field, someone that you admire. So go on LinkedIn or you go on, on other different kinds of uh, resources and find someone and follow them and then ask them if they would be willing to mentor you or ask them if they would at least answer a question of what do I do next? Where do I go from here? Because the people in the career that you want are going to be more than happy to say, oh, this is exciting. Somebody else, you know, admires me, and they're going to offer you advice that you can use. Okay, thank you. So we're kind of back to the mentoring thing again, a little bit, really. It's important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nancy, a question has come in specifically for you, um, and they've asked, how do you make people listen when you're in a leadership role as a woman in a room full of people who are experienced and have been in the industry longer than you have? This is an issue in the tech field, and you don't see many women in a leadership role. How can we change that? I think some of the things that you know we've heard have also spoken to that, but perhaps you can give your own personal perspective. Sure, and I, I love to hear from the other panelists as well. Is to start, definitely. I mean, I, I would be lying if I didn't uh, have imposter syndrome every time I walk <laughs> into a room. And similar to you know Megan's story, where um, if you hear, hey, this is the general manager, let's say, of AWS Backup, and you turn on the video camera these days for, uh, we call it Chime meetings, and you see my face, and you're like, oh, OK, is, is Nancy not available? Well, I am Nancy. So that definitely inspires me to achieve even more and to, to be even more, because only then, right, going back to what Jill has also said, being super legitimate, right, or legit as the millennials would say, <laughs> <laughs> these days, um, being super legit, just really knowing your stuff front and back will help to erase any of that imposter syndrome feeling. At the same time, right, that's also the, you know, being the only woman in the room isn't the paradigm that we should seek to have in the next 10 years. In fact, you know, I was a speaker for the Grace Hopper conference last year where uh, folks who are CTOs or CEOs at major corporations, we've pledged to reach 50-50 gender parity by 2050. And that is a promise I want to also uphold as a hiring manager. So for every role that I have, I try to have at least one woman um, in the final rounds or to have a non all male panel for every role that I hire for my team. Okay, so thank you very much for that perspective. Um, so the next question, um, I'm going to ask a couple of um, 
people with to respond to this one. And I'd like to start with Camille, actually. Um, you're out and about at the moment or not over Zoom, meeting a lot of people, talking to a lot of in, uh, young people with an interest in STEM. Um, so what would be the one thing that you would recommend to a school to do to increase the interest in STEM careers among girls and minorities? I think that the biggest thing that we can do is show role models to those young women. I think that seeing someone that you can imagine yourself being in the future is one of the most impactful things that we can do for those women. Um, and I think it's important also for all of the men in that school as well to see women in these roles. Because if a young boy is able to see a woman, a minority woman in a STEM leadership position, then they're able, that's normalized. That's not surprising to them when they get into the workforce. And I think that when we, kind of even going back to the question that you just answered, when you then have the other people in the room around you, if you are the only woman who respect your voice in a different way because that's become normalized for them. I think that those role models are really important for young women and I hope to be one of them for a lot of young women across the country as I go and kind of normalize being the science princess. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. So Lisa, to you as well, what, if you were giving advice to a school, what is the one thing that they could do to increase engagement among girls and minorities for STEM? Um, I, I really do agree with, with the previous answer um, that we need to have women out there up in front saying this is, this is what STEM careers look like for women and they're exciting and they're fun and you can change the world and you can really do whatever you want and you can start, you might have something in mind when you first get into the field because like I said, I started in the actually uh, doing computer programming and uh, that wasn't what I ended up doing. I ended up in, in business leadership and along the way did some engineering stuff. Um, so a STEM career and a STEM education can really take you anywhere, but I think we do need to lead by example. And it, again, when I say it can take you anywhere, I, I truly mean it can take you anywhere, no matter what career path you choose. I haven't quite finished my career path, and uh, so we're gonna see where that's going in another different direction. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I mean, I've been given the opportunity to travel extensively, to have a great career, to live in countries that, um, you know, that are not my own, clearly. Um, so, you know, I, I cannot begin to say the, the op to emphasize the number of opportunities that are out there and that really we still have no idea where we are going to go most of the time. Um, so, Dr. Keisha, interested to hear from you on this point as well. Minorities and women in STEM, what, what do we need to do? So I think as I talked about, um, two of the challenges with uh, getting minorities and women or getting folks in and then having them stay or retention. And so I think we hit upon really strongly uh, the mentors, having sponsors to assist. Uh, if you're a university or school partner with your local uh, businesses or hospital and create programs. The earlier, the better. Uh, start in elementary school. It's not too early to get involved. So whether it's a college and you have students going out tutoring or uh, working with students or uh, your you know, post-secondary program and you have people volunteering um, at the high schools, as much as we can get involved, that, that will be helpful. And then the second thing is I think doing those co-op and internship opportunities I had a chance to do those as I was coming up and trying to figure out where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And that helped me to understand the parts of healthcare I liked and the parts of healthcare that maybe were not my uh, preference. So I think it's the mentoring, like I said, it's getting involved early um, and helping students understand the opportunities in STEM. And then the third thing are the internship and co-ops. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so. Uh, I think we've talked a lot this evening already about um, empowerment and uh, enthusiasm, passion for what we're doing, the opportunities. Um, but I, one of the questions that's come in is about uh, creativity. And I think maybe that's something as science geeks um, that you know maybe uh, people don't associate with scientists. So I'd be really interested to uh, know, and this was a question uh, that did come in, um, how important is creativity in what we do every day? And Jill, maybe I could start with you and then we can go to Megan. I have to laugh a little bit because uh, one of the things about engineering is that it's science 
with creativity. You have to be thinking creatively to solve a problem. If you're given a problem, how do I make this particular uh, thing move in a specific way? You have to be creative to figure that out. You don't just look at a book and say, oh, this is how it's done, period. You have to look and see maybe how something was done similarly and put your own creative spin on it to be able to make it work. So really, uh, I really love the new or the newer uh, acronym, which is science, technology, engineering, art, and math, which adds the art and the creativity back into the engineering equation. Yeah, thank you. That was lovely insight. Thanks. And Megan, perhaps you could give us a specific example where you've used that creativity. And then Nancy, I'll forewarn you that I'm coming to you for your perspective. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I would have to say I never really thought of myself as a, a really creative person because I wasn't very good at art. <laughs> um, but that is something, just like you said, it's science with creativity built into it. Um, as a, a quality department, like I said earlier, we start with a problem. And you have to figure out how you're going to solve this problem. So you have to work your way backward. And once you've found the root cause of the problem, it doesn't just stop there. Um, you know, we'll have an issue with components that are too close together or we'll, we'll have uh, any number of other uh, undesirable criteria that are in front of us that we want to eliminate. And so it's not, well, this bracket doesn't fit or this cog does not fit in said hole. Scrap it, go get a new cog. Mm, let's back up for just a quick second. Uh, in manufacturing, you also have to look at utilizing the resources that are in front of you. Is there a way that I can make this square peg magically fit in that octagonal hole? Um, and you have to bake that creativity in. You have to think outside the box. Um, and don't just do what the person ahead of you did uh, in order to solve that problem, because it probably wasn't the exact same problem. It wasn't the exact same criteria. Um, and so being able to add in that creativity to say, well, what if I just do it just a tiny bit differently and let's see what the outcome is, um, is really, really important in being able to solve problems, um, just like Jill said. Okay, so thank you. And over to you, Nancy. Yeah, and if we, if we just look at the evolution of computer science from mainframes, uh, the you know, old IBM sort of stacks to you know, client-server models to today you hear about containers or even serverless or quantum computing where the state isn't zero or one but somewhere in between called a qubit. Right? So as uh, computing evolves, you also see different applications of computing. So I think to uh, earlier ask question around AI and robotics, actually one organization that my nonprofit is working with uh, for a symposium in early October, definitely look up uh, Daniela Roos. So she is the first female director of MIT's uh, CSAIL, which stands for Computer Science Artificial Intelligence Laboratory uh, at MIT. So she's a trailblazer, and you get to he really hear from her story how she uh, started the sort of department at Dartmouth, then moved to MIT, and really uh, pioneered different applications of robotics, from you know robots to uh, robotics that can be now used in, for example, warehouses to help alleviate some of the stresses and burdens on human workers as we see the demand for, let's say, COVID-19 uh, purchases go up. Thank you very much, and I have been very grateful to the service provided by a number of your companies over the course of the pandemic to get all of my deliveries to my front door. <laughs> so, um, but Watch I think out for the drones. Next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so. Trust forever. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, from my perspective, you know, in terms of this idea of creativity in science or engineering, I think there's a really terrific example right outside the studio door with the Bethlehem, the steel iron pigs. And, you know, they were very functional pieces of engineering, but they're absolutely stunningly beautiful um, as well. So uh, that for me is the embodiment of creativity in science. So, um, Okay, so I think we're moving towards our last question. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to take us around the circle again for this one. Uh, what would you tell, what piece of advice would you give to your high school self um, if you were able to go back in time and meet yourself again? Jill, starting with you. What I would tell my high school self would be to stick to it, do the math, but don't forget the music. Yeah. And that's what I pretty much would do. 
Okay, great. Short, snappy answer, which is apparently what we need right at the, at the moment as we're coming to the end of the program. So Keisha, short and snappy from you too. So I would tell myself to work and study hard, but play harder. And I think that you have to reward yourself along the way and create time for family, friends, and hobbies and activities. Thank you. Megan. Every single time you think that you have completely blown it and completely failed, you are actually getting ready to take the next step towards exactly where you want to be. Okay, great. Lisa. Um, I would tell myself, follow your dreams. Do what it is that you aspire to do. Don't let stereotypes handcuff you into something that is not uniquely you and genuinely you, and just really go for it. Okay. Camille. I would say two things. One, you think you know what you want to do, you don't know what you want to do. <laughs> two, um, you don't always know what you're capable of. And Nancy. Yeah, and I would say never stop learning because if you do feel like you know everything about something, well, it's time to move on. So for me, it would be to tell myself, um, well, I like the, you think you know what you're going to do, but you really don't, because that was certainly true. Um, I think for me, it was yesterday was an adventure, today was an adventure, tomorrow's going to be another adventure, so try to get enough sleep. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's all the time that we have this evening. Um, I've really enjoyed myself. I hope you have all too. A very special thank you to all of the viewers who've written in with their questions and joining us to participate today. Um, and, th and thank you very much to the panelists for sharing such inspiring stories and advice. I've really enjoyed hearing about your careers and the challenges that you faced and why you're so passionate about what you all do. Um, I wish I worked in, in some of your workplaces, could really come and really understand um, what you're all doing every day. Uh, the cab over truck, I understand, is where the drivers sit above the engine. So I found out about the pigments in um, uh, the sports drink bottles and the back of the Apple iPhone. I've learned about elephants uh, toothpaste. I've learned about new mentors. I have learned about hydraulics, but I'm not sure I yet still understand. Um, and Keisha, I'm very grateful to you for joining us from afar and uh, telling us all more about uh, CHOP and what you're doing every day there to help save the lives of our children. And Megan, uh, yeah, your father must have been a saint when you were growing up. That's not a word that I think my, my family would use to describe <laughs> him, but he is definitely a rock star. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so... Um, I hope you've shared our enthusiasm for everything that you know we've talked about um, this evening, and uh, we look forward to welcoming you into our world uh, of STEM as you engage on an exciting path forward in your careers. So thanks to all of you for tuning in. Okay, we're moving to some more videos, I think, or a video. As a cosmetic chemist, it's a lot of fun being still using chemistry in science, but also using it in cosmetics, which to me are extremely fun. I'm still a scientist, but I get to like play with makeup all day. As women, we see everything in a different perspective. Diversity is always good for innovation. If you have everyone looking the same, thinking the same, you're probably not gonna innovate as much. So I really uh, hope and see in the future that there's gonna be a lot more girls involved in STEM and they can do it. If we show girls that science is everywhere, then they can find their passion. Roz, thank you for serving as moderator for us this evening and to your colleagues at Sanofi for serving as presenting sponsor of this event. And once more, thank you to our panelists. Wow, what an incredible evening. For the young women in the audience, our panelists have shown us that STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math will set you apart. It will give you the framework for processing and solving problems and give you the opportunity to create breakthrough solutions, solving some of our most pressing global problems and really make a difference in the world. Like these women, you too can pursue your dreams. 
On behalf of the Da Vinci Science Center, thank you to all of this evening's sponsors who so generously support the advancement of women and girls in STEM. Thank you also to PBS 39 for partnering with us to transition this program from an in-person to a broadcast event during the COVID pandemic. This broadcast will be available on the Da Vinci Science Center and PBS websites. Also, for more information about our panelists, the Da Vinci Science Center's Women in Science and Engineering programs, or the If Then Ambassadors, please visit our website. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Have a wonderful night. <laughs>